welcome to season two of uh, Gender Equality Talks Live, which uh, features 90 for 90 global voices demanding that progress on gender equality must be on track to deliver on UN Sustainable Development Goals in the next 90 months, that is by 2030 or before. Uh, so today we have amongst us a very special guest, a very respected guest, and an who has been an inspiration for a uh, lot many of us over the years, especially on context of when it comes to gender justice, when it comes to social justice, and especially when it comes to sex workers' rights. She is no other than Meena Seshuji. Meena ji, bahut, bahut welcome. You are most welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Let us hear from Meena ji that, um, uh, like in her experience and context, are we anywhere near the halfway point in achieving gender equality? Over to you, Meena ji. Thank you, Bobby. Achha, the main issue over here is that if we're looking at sex workers, because we work with sex workers, we work with Dalit women, we work with uh, rural women, uh, we work with Muslim women, uh, Sangram sort of works with uh, these communities. The problem with sex workers is, especially when you're looking at uh, female sex workers, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, after so many years of work, I still cannot say that sex workers are treated, female sex workers are even considered women. They are bad and what they do is evil work. And this understanding sort of has so much of an impact on the way government looks at sex workers. So, you know, this whole thing of gender equality, uh, listen, we are not even talking about equality as human beings who are, happen to be women. We are talking about a group of people who are so deeply marginalized by the state and society, both, that they are people who are having to make lives outside of the margins of society. In this situation, we expect that the government will actually you know, make a lot of effort to see that these people are brought into mainstream society, but that kind of effort I cannot see, frankly. If you look at the HIV programming of government of India, you have targeted interventions for sex workers, female sex workers, male sex workers, and transgender sex workers. But the problem is that most of those um, programs uh, have become off late, I mean, I can say off late, um, totally devoid of centering the voices of these communities. What has happened is that they've become very medicalized uh, and therefore the uh, government's interest in addressing the issues that these communities are facing is very, very minimal. In this situation, I think to look at gender equality is a uphill task for these communities. They are, and I agree with you, we had actually crossed many bridges in the past and we are now actually having to recede and go back. And so therefore it is very sad for the communities also because the communities experienced a certain amount of strengthening, a certain amount of you know government listening to their voices, a certain amount of confidence that they are important citizens of this country. And now when the government has decided that they are no longer important because of the medicalized, uh, non-human rights, um, you know, programming that we have for uh, HIV, we find that we have receded back uh, on, on all our gains of uh, working with sex workers. So. I personally believe that I don't think we are anywhere even near the halfway mark. So that's my personal opinion on this. Yeah, thank you so much, Meenaji, for raising these important issues. And to totally, uh, these resonate with us and we totally echo. Uh, uh, so, uh, so what challenges do you foresee? Because uh, uh, I believe that uh, you and I will like to definitely are will be among those who want gender equality, not by 2030, but now. When so we were even looking at HIV prevention in the old days, we used to literally have to beg the Department of Health to sit down and have a conversation with the Department of Home. That actually never, ever happened. So, you know, how many times have sex workers been picked up with a condom that is actually given by government? 
you can't buy nirod the ordinary nirod because that is not sold anywhere in the country you can get deluxe nirod but you can't get the um, the government it's everywhere it's not for sale police knows this right so police knows that this condom that they have found is actually the condom that has been distributed by the government of health by the ministry of health government of india yet they use this condom to you know i mean there are lots of um, policies saying you shouldn't do this etc but the police actually on the ground continue to use the condom as evidence to harass maybe they're not bringing it up in court so you're not actually seeing it as a case in court but you actually see it on the ground i mean on the ground this is very very often that the police will pick you up and say you keep saying no no i'm not a sex worker and they'll say see this you know um condoms in your bag this says that you're a sex worker and then the harassment you know increases so my uh, argument actually is that unless the state is serious about mainstreaming the issues of sex workers and actually believing that sex workers have a right to live as humans in this country we are not going to because see the law is so ambivalent right the law says very clearly that sex work per se is not illegal it's everything around sex work that is illegal yet you find that the government is not um you know uh, in fact recently in an ncw meeting in mumbai the ig of police uh, maharashtra has said that they have decided that they shall make uh, maharashtra kuntan khana mukt kuntan khana is brothel right now my question is women are going to work so what do they think that only maharashtra is their jurisdiction rest of india is not their i mean they are not responsible for it women are going to leave these brothels and go somewhere to work within this country so are we not all responsible you know if you bring up anything you are accused to be anti nationalist i think today in this situation the police are behaving anti nationalist because they are not looking at the fact that people are going to become more unsafe you know more uh, vulnerable to hiv and it's, we are also seeing a lot of sexually transmitted infections coming back right all of this is huge for this country and the why is the police so non sensitive and why do you think that if one area you're going to sort of throw these sex workers out they're going to be in this country only and we are all responsible for what is happening in this country why do the police think that and you know so therefore when we when i think of gender equality i keep thinking we have a state or we have people in this state who are in high positions of power this is the ig of police bhai maharashtra state who are thinking in this way how do we assume that you know our sustainable development goals will be reached with this kind of understanding of uh, what is happening in the state of maharashtra totally totally agree and uh, yeah because while uh, you were speaking i was getting reminded of um, i remember you speaking at uh, the 10th asia pacific conference on reproductive and sexual health and rights in 2020 during the when the lockdown got um, uh, you know yes. uh, clamped down and uh, i think it was in march or april like very soon after the lockdown got clamped and you raised very important issues how uh, communities of sex worker women and uh, dalit women and others were so uh, badly impacted at that time so i think uh, it's it is another remind, grim reminder that you know, why why uh, so, so many people who are the, perpetually on the blind spot and also on the blind spot of, of of policy policy so much of policy work so what do you recommend meena ji like what uh, like what more should be happening in india and globally to address the issues and challenges which you have raised so ably and i really hope that uh, those who are at women deliver in kigali rionda right now and who will be uh, going to you know the international hiv science conference in brisbane is of international aid society and governments of course like you know they need to listen to the voices um uh, I mean, which are informed by the people like you at at a very small microcosm level very very small level we have been able to achieve some level of success because of this 
idea that if you organize sex workers and they come together, they're more able to deal with the issues that they face. Could It could be, you know, some petty criminal gangs, hoodlums, loan sharks, all of the above. So that level, I think organizing sex workers has shown trafficking, minors in sex work, you know, not allow, uh, keeping them, uh, their areas safe. We have been advocating with government forever that one of the best anti-trafficking groups you can have are sex workers themselves, who once strengthened to fight back against these kind of, uh, you know, exploitative practices can actually make them these spaces safe. So my thing is one is you really need to encourage this kind because remember HIV also taught us that when the programming was uh, human rights centric to the communities most affected, we found that the response to HIV was very very good. Right? I mean we saw that, and in fact we then very happily declared openly to the world that you know that we have brought down HIV in India. Who did it? It is these very marginalized communities that we had invested in throughout the country. I mean, wherever uh, there, were pro there were programs for HIV, it was done with communities. It was done with key populations. They actually really responded to the call, you know, and um, we saw that. I, I think we really need to go back to people-centric policies. We need to go back to centering, if we are serious about the uh, SDGs, if we are serious about gender equality, we will have to place a lot of um, resources, um, community strengthening. Uh, we need to look at rights-based approaches. We need to understand how in the early days of the epidemic, we uh, appealed to uh, the sex workers uh, and they responded. We need to remember that. We need to look at those lessons. And maybe there are answers there which the government should actually have to go back to if they're serious about uh, gender equality. My feeling is they're not. <laughs> you know, it, they just have signed off on this thing. And now they think that if they have frame a few policies and frame a few laws that sound very, very, uh, you know, uh, pro people, uh, it will automatically take care of everything. It's not true. You have to invest in people, which the government is not doing. You're so it's so true that probably if governments were really serious about gender equality, then they also need to be very serious about ending uh, religious fundamentalism, ending militarization, ending capitalism, ending so many other problems which are so deeply rooted, and also of course patriarchy. Which is at such a heart of it. Problem any closing with, thoughts? Any any over yeah, to you? The problem yeah, with what you're saying, Bobby, is all of this is true. Okay. And it's not going anywhere. Ending capitalism, ending patriarchy. I, I, I mean, I don't even think I'm going to see all this in my lifetime. It's not happening. What can happen is if governments actually start looking at people-centric policies and invite people. You're making a policy on sex work. Invite them onto the table. Ask them what makes sense for them. You have laws, you have policies that you're sitting in your ivory towers and making for people and you're expecting equality. It's not going to happen. Right? Why we understand the malaise, why we understand that this is because of these larger systems. But if you as a government are serious, you know, I mean, I'm really reminded of, um, unfortunately, this is true, in Maharashtra, when COVID hit us, what we got actually was people-centric policies. And that really made a difference on the ground. We need people-centric policies. We need governments to work with us because if we don't, if the government doesn't work with us, none of us are going to get out of this mess that we are in. Mm -hmm. And as I mean, the, the citizens. I don't mean, uh, you know, a few actors. That doesn't help. You really need to invest in communities. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Let's, uh, uh, perhaps we can conclude with that thought that the governments really need to invest in communities and people-centric policies have played such a key role. And there's so yes. many lessons uh, from so many movements and people's struggles and movements around, including HIV 
and of course like uh, people like you who you know the kind of uh, 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 you know the people centric uh, policy recommendations which come uh, up, I, I think th th those they make so much sense and they have shown that they work in yes. uh, in other communities also. Absolutely. So thanks a lot, Meena ji again. Uh, it was really uh, so insightful for me personally and I am sure for many others. So friends who have joined us lay, uh, late, uh, we were listening to Meena Seshu ji. Uh, she uh, had founded Sangram and uh, of course is one of those who created the uh, Vaishya Anyai Mukti Parishad, V-A-N-P which is a collective of people in sex work. And she was uh, speaking as part of uh, the ongoing season two of Gender Equality Talks Live, which features 90 for 90 global voices who demand that progress on gender equality and all other goals and targets of SDGs, because governments have committed to that, must be on track to deliver on. Um, uh, so let's hope it does. And let's hope the people-centric policies remain at the heart of, of, um, of government's responses. Of course, like the accountability to peoples as well. So thanks a lot, Meena ji, again, and all power to you and uh, all my salam and regards to everyone at Sangram and Vam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. So